Indian Society of Nephrology uh, for this wonderful opportunity to present my work. Um, today, um, in the next few minutes, we will be talking about uh, sepsis in general. And um, just a little overview, because I'm not going to uh, go over the rest of it, uh, which or repeat what we have done before. Uh, then we'll focus on the immune dysfunction or the inflammatory dysfunction in sepsis. Uh, I'll give you a little clinical data followed by some laboratory uh, uh, data focusing on cell culture as well as uh, rodent sepsis phases. Um, and we'll come to that. And lastly, we'll talk about how uh, metabolic dysfunction affects all of the above. So um, let's start. Um, sepsis, at least here in the United States, it's, a, it states it's the 11th leading cause of death uh, in the ICUs. Um, more importantly than that, it is the number one cause of death in the non-coronary intensive care units. Um, so sepsis mortality, interestingly enough, more than 60% of the patients die during late sepsis. And I'll prove my point when I talk about that. Whereas um, over 30 different modalities and $30 billion have been spent in studying different specific quote unquote therapies in sepsis, all each one of them targeting early sepsis. So no wonder we've never been able to change the course of sepsis ever. Um, so needless to say, we are in dire need um, for ta of targeted therapies in sepsis. Just a little overview about sepsis. Um, uh, we just changed our definition to um, um, uh, in 2016, where now we define sepsis as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. So it is not all about the infection anymore. It is as much about the, how we respond as uh, uh, to that infection. And septic shock, it, now we define septic shock as a subset of sepsis in which the underlying circulatory and cellular slash metabolic abnormalities are profound enough to increase mortality. And there I have um, underlined the cellular metabolic because uh, that is a new sort of addition and it's, um, it's, a, it's a change from our previous position. Um, and it's a good change. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so the critical components, no pun intended here, of septic shock are uh, persistent hypotension despite fluid resuscitation um, and requirement of vasopressors just to maintain a mean arterial blood pressure over 65 millimeters of mercury. And in addition to that, a serum lactate level of greater than two millimoles per liter despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So you have to fulfill both these requirements now in order for us to call it um, septic shock. Um, the mortality uh, in sepsis, uh, then again, the, uh, when the task, why did they choose lactate is because when they, um, the task force actually agreed that um, it's a marker of immune dysfunction. Um, so why does hyperlactatemia occur? It's because of insufficient oxygen delivery that we've been taught in the biochemistry class long time ago. I'm sure all of you will remember. Um, but in addition to that, there is a impaired aerobic respiration as well. So in, so in other words, you don't even have to be hypoxic uh, in order to get uh, to glycolysis. And that's the phenomenon we will be discussing and a little more in details today. And of course, there is reduced uh, hepatic clearance in some cases. So it's a multifactorial disease. But having said all that, it doesn't matter what increases the lactate level. When, they, um, when we looked at the surviving sepsis campaign database, uh, it was pretty clear that when the lactate increases from two to 10, and it's uh, like not just two points, but from two to 10, for example, the odds of uh, hospital mortality increased from 1.4 to, to almost double, so or over double. So lactate seems to be doing something here. Um, and so, um, uh-oh. All right, so uh, why is it so difficult to treat sepsis? And the problem with sepsis is it's not like uh, myocardial infarction where you know the time of onset because there is that chest pain. Here, we don't know when sepsis started. We know when the patient presented to you and you and I saw the patient. Well, that's different. But the actual onset of sepsis is unclear. 
Um, and so we don't know where in the course of that dynamic disease, whether they have presented to you early or they have presented to you late. And that's why um, it makes it so difficult to treat these uh, patients because the therapies are actually diametrically opposite. And that's the point I'm gonna show, that's the data I'm gonna show you why so. So these, this is just an example, just to impress upon you how many therapies we have tried and failed. Um, so it's a whole host of things that we have tried, um, but we've never been able to wrap our hands around this, uh, this beast called sepsis or septic shock. So um, this data, and I'm, there are multiple studies that have come out, but I'm, I'm particularly going to show you this one because it actually did a neat um, a little analysis of almost a thousand patients. This data came out of Europe back in 2011, so it's nothing new. Um, but they, they divided these patients up into th three different phases. Phase one, from days one to five after diagnosis of sepsis. Phase two, se days six through 15 after diagnosing sepsis. And phase three, between 16 and 150 after diagnosing sepsis. So, the more, so there were almost a third, 308 patients died of sepsis, 36.7% of those died during early phase, like almost one third, a little over one third. Whereas majority, over 63% of them died during phases two and three. So from what we understand, all the therapies had focused as soon as a patient presents to us, um, which is probably falling within the phase one, uh, whereas the mortality occurrence occurs during uh, phase two and three. And so this is, um, this is important um, because it's, uh, it's sort of, um, a pa it's a basically a paradigm change from what we used to think before. And so when they further looked at um, what are these patients dying of, so then they, the first thing to go to was the blood culture. So they saw that about 14.9% positivity rate, that almost 15% occurred during phase one, during first five days. Phase two it dropped a little bit to 11.3%. Presumably all these patients are on antibiotics. And phase three, there was a resurgence of um, infect, rate of infection or positivity of blood, um, blood cultures. Um, and this is interesting because you definitely know these patients must be on, on antibiotics. So when they actually speciated these, um, they noticed that um, the uh, typically opportunistic bacteria, the percentage of these changed and increased over time. So there were not that many, say about 7% um, uh, opportunistic bacteria uh, that occurred 7 to 9% during first uh, phase upon presentation versus like or, or through phase one. But that percentage increased to 14 followed by 17%. So it looks like opportunistic infections were happening more and more during this late sepsis. Whereas, and also when they looked at candida, that's even more impressive. There was a significant increase during phases two and three in the candida infections as well, indicating that maybe there is something happening to this, uh, these patients that is fundamentally different, right? So, um, so how do you test? So it looks like there is something real about these, uh, this immunosuppression. So how do you test this experimentally? And that's what my collaborator and I do in our laboratories. But in order for you to test whether or not the septic patients are immunosuppressed, you have to test the hypothesis by giving them a second sort of challenge, a second hit uh, with, and we chose to do that with the lipopolysaccharide. It's the cell wall product of gram-negative bacteria. Um, we also call it endotoxin. Maybe some of you all remember that. And so in order to test the response, we gave these, um, uh, you know, we first took some patients uh, versus normal volunteers. So N1 and N2 are your normal volunteers. This is old data again from 2011 um, from our laboratories. And uh, we took some patients and isolated their monocytes and hit them. These are septic shock patients, patient one and patient two. And we hit them all. So all the, the leukocytes that are coming from either normal volunteers N1 and 2 versus patient uh, blood, P1 and P2, and hit them with LPS, lipopolysaccharide. And then we looked at the pro-inflammatory cytokine expression, TNF alpha messenger RNA expression, um, and showed that there was something fundamentally different about these patients versus the normal volunteers. While the N1 and N2, they put out a huge response, 60-fold change 
um, versus, again, we had the control. Um, uh, this is versus control, which is not hit with the LPS. So there's uh, anywhere from 40 to 60 fold increase in TNF messenger RNA expression in normal volunteers, whereas in patients one and two, it was, uh, the percentage was very little, uh, close to the, or even less than 10%. And so it looks like these patients were unable to respond to the second LPS stimulus or the second hit. So now we came to the experimental model for which we used um, rodents or mice, um, and we made them septic using, now we, so going from the cell data, now we are going to the rodent data where we made these mice have fecal ligation and puncture. So basically fecal peritonitis in these patients, and we are going to refer to them as sepsis. And in order to test immunosuppression, like we did to the cells, we, give, we gave lipopolysaccharide or the endotoxin as a second hit, second hit to the entire mouse, so intraperitoneal injection of uh, LPS at different time points. Now, then again, this is a huge difference from your clinical scenario. We know what time we did CLP, and so we can time it correctly to see the phases, right? And then we looked at the inflammatory response. So let me talk about what we looked at in just a second. Um, it turns out that you and I have all these leukocytes that are running around in our blood vessels. Um, when there is an infection or any inflammation for that matter, um, these cells start running around inside our blood vessels because they are trapped inside the vasculature. They have to somehow get out of the vasculature to fight off quote unquote infection or engulf the organism. And so the way they do that is um, quite interesting. And um, basically, this is your free-flowing leukocyte, right? And now, um, you know, once there is an uh, inflammatory stimulus, now you have, this is happening at the sort of microvenular level, 20 or so micron um, diameter level. And these cells, the leukocytes start slowing down, and we call that rolling. And then it's with the help of adhesion molecules, et cetera. We'll not go into details of that. That's followed by then uh, by the firm adhesion um, uh, to the endothelial surface. Uh, and then they look at the gap between the two endothelial cells, and they sort of make their way out, called emigration. So now, turns out that this firm adhesion to the endothelial surface um, is a very sensitive marker for uh, inflammation. And it changes, it's an interactive process. So these tubes are not like lined with lead, they're lined with uh, endothelial cells. So this is all, this is a live system, whether it's in, in the leukocyte inside or the endothelial cell outside. Um, so then we then measure uh, these leukocytes that are adhering to the endothelial cell in a minute of recording in the right uh, in a given vasculature. And we can then count the adhesion response per square millimeter in the microvasculature. And that's what my laboratory does. So this is a little busy slide. Um, so we coming back to our CLP mice, the ones that we made septic, um, and then we gave them or not give them leukos, uh, a lipopolysaccharide to test whether or not they put out this leukocyte adhesion in response to LPS. So the more the leukocyte adhesion, more the inflammation. So now we have found a way to, like this is the way we measure inflammation in a live mouse. And so these, all these mice are, um, are septic. We gave them LPS and studied their leukocyte adhesion at a fixed time after LPS, which is four hours. And so this is a total six hours after the uh, CLP or sepsis, that means sort of two hours after this, somewhere here, they got uh, their LPS or normal saline for control to see whether or not what was the fold change. Uh, and we did that for 12, 18, 24, so on and so forth. And we started to see a very interesting pattern. During the first 12 hours of sepsis, when they got a second hit with LPS, these mice were able to put out more leukocyte adhesion, i.e. more inflammatory response. Um, as you can see, the black bars are significantly higher compared to their, their um, non white bars um, and in, uh, in for, for the first 12 hours. But when they, when we took mice that were 18 hours out of seps or into sepsis, uh, all the way through 36 hours, they these mice seem to actually ignore that LPS, right? There was insignificant change from the normal saline counterparts. 
Um, the mice that survived for 72 hours post sepsis, again, they started to show that there was increase in leukocyte adhesion in response to LPS. So it looks like we came up with three different phases, the hyperinflammatory phase, the initial phase of sepsis, hypoinflammatory. Now we have the late sepsis where there is, the, there is inability to respond to additional sort of infection or inflammation, if you will. And um, the third one was resolution phase. So in other words, we mapped out these phases, the early inflammatory phase, um, hyperinflammatory phase, the late hypoinflammatory phase, uh, followed by the resolution phase, right? In mice, um, again, if the uh, if the second or the hypoinflammatory phase didn't occur, then these mice died. So uh, mind you, the the bias here is uh, this: these are surviving mice. Okay, um, so in other words, now we know that the immunosuppression happens. Um, or at least hypoinflammation happens, but what causes this shift, right? That's a golden uh, hour question as to what, what, what happens, what causes this shift? And that brings me to my next half of presentation. Um, it turns out that the metabolic changes in the immune cells. I'm sure our mothers and our grandmothers have always told you that you are what you eat, correct? The same happens to be true for the cells as well. Turns out that the, during hyperinflammatory response, these immune cells are in the activated state because they have to go out there um, and they have to eat up the organism, leukocytes or other immune cells. So there are these immune cells have three different goals. Number one, phagocytosis. They want to eat up those organisms. Number two, killing of the pathogen. Uh, and number three, rapid turnover of themselves, the cells, right? Because in order to kill the organism, some of these cells or a lot of these cells are going to die in the process, right? And so they have to be able to sustain this process of um, going and killing more and more. And so they have to uh, be able to proliferate. The first two tasks, so to speak, the phagocytosis and the killing of the pathogens, they require energy in the form of ATP. The second one, the killing of the pathogen, you require, the cells require weaponry to kill these organisms, killing capacity. And the third one, which is a rapid regeneration of cells, you need nucleotide synthesis because you have dividing cells, right? And so you need biomass to make more cells, right? So now we can map out our, during the hyperinflammatory response, these are activated immune cells. So what happens here is what we'll talk about in a minute. So it turns out during early sepsis, these activated immune cells, they eat up a lot of our glucose. Uh, we are hungry, we are hypoglycemic, what do we do? We go and eat sugar, we go and eat whatever, a snack. So the cells uh, eat glucose because glucose is relatively easy to transport inside of a cell. Um, and they ramp up their glucose metabolism. Now, once the, cell, the glucose enters inside of these cells, the, this glucose can undergo one of two fates, right? Number one, it can go undergo oxidative phosphorylation um, with creating 36 ATPs, et cetera, et cetera. We have learned all that in Krebs cycle and uh, electron transport chain, et cetera. It's a very efficient process. However, it's a slow process because it's, it's multi-step. And uh, it, so as a result of that, it makes it slow. Um, the first part of that sort of oxidative phosphorylation, uh, you have glycolysis. If you just restrict, if the cell says that if I just restrict myself to glycolysis, I can ramp that up pretty fast because there are, it's a shorter process. It can be upregulated really, really fast because a uh, less number of enzymes have to be transcribed and, and formed. And so as a result of that, it's a fast process. The disadvantage of that process is that it creates only two ATPs. But as we saw, the cell needs more than its ATPs, and we'll come to that. So a similar dilemma is faced by cancer cell. And we solved that mystery. Uh, a proliferating cancer cell also requires sort of something very similar. And we solved that mystery back in 1920. Uh, so it looks like, um, it turns out that the proliferating cancer cells require, uh, they have increased demand for ATP, increased demand for nucleotide synthesis. And Otto Warburg, now, back in 1927, a um, long time ago, really, um, nearly 90 years ago, said that actually uh, he studied this phenomenon and came to a conclusion 
that these cancer cells or the proliferating cancer cells, um, they shift their metabolism uh, strictly to glycolysis. In other words, um, they just restricted themselves to glycolysis and did not go through the oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, mind you, these, these cancer cells are not necessarily under hypoxic or hypoglycemic conditions, and they don't have to do that, but they prefer to do it this way. And the reason for that is because now, even if it produces less number of ATPs, you can compensate for that by eating more and more glucose. It's abundantly available. But in the process of doing uh, or restricting yourself to glycolysis, which we'll come to, to in a minute, um, they can also accumulate um, or form or shunt that glucose 6-phosphate, which is the first step, into other pathways that will give them the nucleotides necessary to synthesize more of themselves or the cancer cells. So I'm not going into details into all this glycolysis and um, pentose phosphate pathway, but I'm sure all of you will remember from a long time ago. So glucose enters the cells, and this is your glyco undergoes glycolysis. First step is the formation of glucose 6-phosphate and go on and on and on to make pyruvate. In the process, you get two ATPs, two NADH molecules, and um, hydrogen ions. Um, but the glucose 6-phosphate can also be utilized or shunted away to the pentose phosphate pathway, which then results into a byproduct of that is ribose 5-phosphate, which can be utilized for nucleotide synthesis. So this, the cancer cell says, well, it's in my best interest to actually restrict myself to pyruvate and then make those nucleotides uh, a shunt glucose 6-phosphate into pentose phosphate pathway and come up with the ribose 5-phosphate that I need for nucleotide synthesis. So coming back to our immune cell, because that's the cell in question, right? And how does it metabolize? So under basal condition, turns out that um, the glucose, the, the immune cell eats up glucose and undergoes, you know, glycolysis to form pyruvate. Now this pyruvate for us, um, mammalian cells, can undergo one of two fates. Um, either it can form acetyl coenzyme A and then undergo oxidative phosphorylation electron transport chain, to form 36 ATPs, um, the molecules of ATP, and a very little of it goes to form lactate. And this is under basal condition. The cell is under no kind of stress. But if the immune cell is in the activated state, which is in response to this LPS that we gave to all these mice and cells, et cetera, um, they express toll-like receptors, and then um, they sort of go into this inflammatory cascade. Turns out, in order to do that or feed into that, you have to have increased, the cell has to have increased glucose, as we saw before. So once the LPS hits these cells and toll-like receptors are, are uh, upregulated, uh, increased glucose uptake um, happens with, and there is another machinery that happens, GLUT pathways, GLUT1, GLUT4, et cetera. I'm not going into details of that. But the immune cells start eating more and more glucose. What happens to those glucose in the immune cells? Um, is it similar to the cancer metabolism? And let's talk about that. So in inactivated immune cells, um, it took about 30 years to, to notice that actually activated immune cells some, does something like Warburg-like uh, effect. Um, it, it was observed that it increases oxygen consumption. It increases its reactive oxygen species production. Uh, it actually actively goes and blocks oxidative phosphorylation, just like a cancer cell, and increases aerobic glycolysis. Although the first observations occurred in 1959, it took another 30, 40, 50 years for the rest of the pathway to be formed. And now we're talking about the aerobic glycolysis. 2016, the TEA group ended up showing that as well in a very um, elegantly done um, uh, data. So the glycolysis uh, in response to the inflammatory stimulus, as it turns out, is actually essential, not just, it doesn't just happen, it's actually essential for the immune cell activation and maturation, immune cell function and survival. So it looks like this glycolysis, preferential glycolysis is actually essential for the immune cell function. So that, that's where your, um, inflammation meets metabolism. And the, as it turns out, that the absence of inflammatory stim, in the absence of inflammatory stimulus, um, your oxidative phosphorylation goes um, as planned, as we saw before. So why does a cell have to do this? Now, the glucose goes in, and how does it do it? 
glucose goes in, glucose 6-phosphate glycolysis is activated. Uh, glucose 6-phosphate um, is produced. Um, it goes on down to form pyruvate with, by way of high glycolysis. But now that the cell is under stressful condition, the oxidative phosphorylation is blocked. Glucose 6-phosphate accumulates. It's shunted away. The excess glucose 6-phosphate phosphate is shunted away to the pentose phosphate pathway uh, to form ribose 5-phosphate. In the process, you get two ATPs, two molecules of NADH, two molecules of NADPH, and most importantly, you get your ribose 5-phosphate for nucleotide synthesis. So in other words, now we can map out this whole pathway in a different way. The shift to glycolysis increases your ATPs, although in, inefficiently, because, but you cannot compensate for it by increasing glucose uptake, right? So you get your uh, ATPs. You get your reactive oxygen species. Remember all those NADH and NADPH and all of that can be used to kill those organisms. So the cells get their killing capacity or the weaponry that is necessary. And in addition to that, shunting to pentose phosphate pathway, now they start to get their nucleotide synthesis requirement fulfilled. And it turns out that glycolysis supports all of these three um, goals of an immune, activated immune cell, just like it did for a cancer cell, correct? How does all this happen? How does cell know to do this? And it turns out there is um, a master regulator of glycolysis called hypoxia inducing factor. Although it says, I'm talking about hypoxia, um, there are a couple of these HIF1 alpha, HIF2, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out HIF1 alpha um, is sort of the ma master regulator and it has to work with HIF2 alpha, uh, HIF1 beta, but we'll not talk about that today. HIF1 alpha is um, induced by hypoxia or inflammation. So really it's, its name is sort of a misnomer. Um, and HIF1 alpha is in turn itself is regulated by several other transcription um, pathways. And that makes only sense because you don't want this to be an unregulated system, right? Can be dangerous. But more importantly, it sits at the junction of metabolism and inflammation, right? And so HIF1 deficient cells, as it turns out, uh, they have decreased glycolysis, no doubt about that, because it's a regulator of glycolysis. But it also has increased oxidative phosphorylation. Cell has to survive somehow. But um, in, uh, what's more important, more important than that is these cells show decreased cell survival and immune function. So that HIF1 alpha seems to be necessary for a good immune function of these in activated immune cells. So again, uh, if you are an activated immune cell, now, now we can map this out a little bit differently or fill in the gaps, so to speak. The toll-like receptors are formed. Uh, glucose uh, uptake is increased. Uh, glucose forms oxidative, uh, gly undergoes glycolysis, forms pyruvate. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation is blocked. So some of it, obviously, excess pyruvate has to get converted into lactate. Uh, if an alpha does that, it actually goes and um, actively upregulates the glycolysis, but not only that, it also downregulates the oxidative phosphorylation. That was Natea's data. Um, and then in the process, you end up getting your ATPs or the cell ends up getting its ATPs, ROS, and uh, nucleotide synthesis. Turns out that the mTOR pathway, which is connected to the, which is upregulated by TLR or regulated by uh, TLR pathway, it actually regulates the HIF1 pathway. So it's a very tightly regulated system. Again, we'll not go into details of the mTOR pathway or for that matter, HIF1 uh, alpha, how it does that in the interest of time. But in the process, coming back to our lactate, this is how you start accumulating your lactate, right? So the lactate that appears in the, in the definition of septic shock now, um, this is how that lactate is formed, part, at least part of it. Um, however, the metabolism changes during late sepsis. All this happens during early sepsis, but in late sepsis, the metabolic changes are pretty profound. Um, and there are a couple of, and this is where we have studied this quite a bit too, um, and that's what makes sepsis a dynamic disease. So changing from hyperinflammatory to hypoinflammatory phase, you're actually changing, uh, the cells are changing what they eat. Um, as we saw, the early sepsis is hyperinflammatory, late sepsis is anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressed. Um, so late sepsis, the cell says, the immune cell says that all these reactive oxygen species, et cetera, is too toxic for me. 
So the cells go into hibernation in order to survive for themselves. And so as a result, in late sepsis, you have um, upregulation. So the, the glycolysis is actually goes away. Glucose oxidation actually decreases considerably. Um, and so uh, the cell has to survive. Cell says, whatever I have inside of me, which is fatty acids, I'll use up my fatty acids to form those acetyl coenzyme A, which then I'll restart my oxidative phosphorylation, and I will actually make energy for myself to survive. And so then the glycolytic phenotype, as it turns out, is pro-inflammatory. So glycolysis and pro-inflammation are tied together with it through HIFN and other pathways. I showed you HIFN because that's the most pronounced one. And the fatty acid oxidation phenotype, well, the minute the cell changes from it, from using glucose to fatty acid oxidation for its survival, it actually becomes an anti-inflammatory or decreases pro-inflammatory pro phenotype in order to survive. So. Um, how, what is the evidence for that? I'm not just pulling it out of here. That's something we have studied in our laboratories. So we take THP1 uh, human monocytic cell line and gave them sepsis or made them septic by giving them LPS uh, one or two doses. So the first LPS dose, um, once we give them during the first eight hours of giving LPS, look, the glucose uptake and oxidation goes up in these cells. Uh, but if you wait for 20, up to 24 hours during its late infl hypoinflammatory phase, the glucose uptake is actually shut down um, and oxidation. And what happens in the meantime, during the same time point, the initial phases, the uh, when the glucose uptake goes up, actually the uh, fatty acid oxidation does not change too much, right? However, when it comes to the, the late phase, the fatty acid oxidation goes up. So glycolysis goes down and fatty acid oxidation goes up during late sepsis, right? And so that's my evidence for saying, and then again, all the studies that I showed you, um, that um, the late sepsis, the cells are eating fatty acid oxidation. So how do cells know to do that, right? So the switch from early to late, my, we have studied those, at least one pathway of those, there are multiple pathways. But um, it is done in our hands, at least, by a highly conserved family of proteins called sirtuins. Uh, sirtuins first came up in aging literature and turns out they are a huge immune modulator as well. Um, so remember all those NAD and NADHs? So they are, uh, so NAD goes, makes NADH and the cycle goes on. NADP, NADPH, that cycle goes on. So in the process of increasing or wrapping up uh, glycolysis, now you have accumulation of NAD, right? Because more and more NAD is formed. And so uh, this, these sirtuins are nothing other than NAD sensors. They actually want to eat up that NAD, right? And so that's how, now the sirtuins, get formed. And these sirtuins are inherently, uh, in response to energy accumulation, these are inherently anti-inflammatory molecules. So sirtuins are anti-inflammatory. So as it turns out that the glycolysis is ramped up, NAD production or accumulation is ramped up, cell says, I want to survive. It increases its sirtuin expression, um, which then helps you calm down the anti, so because the sirtuins are also linked to the anti-inflammatory cascade, or anti-inflammatory uh, pathways are upregulated. And, and the process, um, when this, and all this is well and good as long as it's a regulated process, but the sustained, at some point that has to stop. The increased sirtuin expression um, has to stop. And when that doesn't happen, uh, sepsis, septic shock, the late hypoinflammatory phase is sustained. So in other words, uh, in our hands in the same publications, we have shown that the highs or other publications also, that the high sirtuin levels actually decreases glycolysis and increase fatty acid oxidation in immune cells. And so it looks like the, um, this NAD, nothing that the body does ever goes to waste. And so this NAD accumulation then senses, um, or tells us, uh, the senses uh, is sensed by the uh, sirtuins, which then in turn upregulate up fatty acid oxidation, decrease glycolysis, and help a cell survive by going into hibernation. So now we can map out that the increased sirtuins are the ones at least in our hands, in addition 
multiple other pathways have been studied in literature, but they basically do the same thing, that they increase their sirtuins. Uh, so now, how do I, what happens if you inhibit sirtuin? Uh, in our hands, we have shown that when the cell, or when the rare, uh, mice go into this hypoinflammatory phase, and now we go ahead and block sirtuins, not only do they survive more, but uh, sirtuin inhibition reverses this fatty acid oxidation to, uh, uh, to uh, glycolytic phase. So that's how it makes the cell actually uh, reverse endotoxin tolerance that we showed, or uh, reverse its hypoinflammatory phase um, and survive more. And I forgot to put that in the slide. Coming back to our lactate. Remember, we can never forget that lactate. So it turns out that it's a marker for hypoxia-related aerobic conditions, but also a marker for anaerobic glycolysis, which we just saw, um, uh, with a decreased uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And so shift to glycolysis actually is trying to tell you, uh, or accumulation of lactate, in other words, is trying to tell you that there is immune dysfunction happening here. But does it by itself cause immunosuppression? Right, that's an important question. Not yet conclusively solved in immune literature. However, in tumor microenvironment, environment, it turns out to be the, the fact. Um, as it turns out, that the, the in tumor cells, when there is ramped up glycolysis, increased lactate or lactic acid in the tumor microenvironment, like not the metabolic acidosis that we talk about in sepsis but in, in the local environment, um, that modulation is, uh, it modulates the pro versus anti-inflammatory function differently. Lactic acidosis actually affects T cell function. The acidosis decreases effector T cells. So there are two types of T cells, two types of macrophages, the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory. So lactic acidosis, as it turns out, it decreases the pro-inflammatory T cell function, but it does not change the anti-inflammatory T cell function. So in other words, it shifts the balance towards the anti-inflammatory or um, immune suppression phenotype. Also, it changes macrophage function by doing uh, the following, that the pro-inflammatory um, macrophages are actually, um, the pro-inflammatory, the anti-lactic acidosis changes the anti-inflammatory um, uh, phenotype, whereas towards the anti-inflammatory phenotype, however, it does not change the hyper hyperchloremic acidosis, it's not just a pH change, in other words. Hypo, hyperchloremic acidosis does not do that. It actually is pro-inflammatory, but lactic acidosis, as it turns out, at least in the tumor environment, um, it turns out to be an anti-inflammatory um, inducer. So lactic acidosis may affect cell uh, or immune cell function even during sepsis. However, we have not proved that in any sort of conclusive uh, way as of yet. So, um, in future, as it turns out, that phase-specific therapies are necessary because we have to target cells. Uh, therapeutic strategies have to be different during the pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory or hyper-inflammatory versus hypo-inflammatory phase. So the hyper-inflammatory, uh, and in order to do that, uh, we can now come up with therapies that decrease glycolysis during early phase, which will decrease the pro-inflammatory or hyper-inflammatory phenotype. But in the late hypoinflammatory phase, we can um, now we need to increase glycolysis, uh, increase fatty acid, uh, decrease fatty acid oxidation. And the example of that I just showed you something like sirtuin inhibition. Uh, and we have other pathways that we are studying that are close to um, the phase two, three trial, phase two trials, really. So, in conclusion, sepsis can be viewed as an immunometabolic disease. Uh, metabolic changes differ, are different during early versus late sepsis. The new metabolic targets for treatment uh, need to be explored. Um, and lactate elevation that we saw in the sepsis, septic shock definition, it actually indicates shift to glycolysis, which in turn indicates immune dysfunction during sepsis. So it has a function more than a biomarker. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab, um, who did most of the work. I just analyzed the data. Um, and my collaborators, uh, who again um, were very helpful in all this process, um, and none of this would have been possible without NIH's support. Um, so these are my active grants. And that's my disclosure as well. Um, and most importantly, I thank um, uh, Indian Necrolo Society of Nephrology to give me the chance to present my data.
And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you.